Hello everyone and welcome to our first video this week after my trip um, to California. We arrived home at about 2 in the morning last night, got in bed by close to 3, so I'm a little sleepy but I did sleep until 8 o'clock which I haven't done in years. <laughs> so I did get some sleep and I feel so excited to be home and I have so many ideas that I need. I need a couple days to just write them all down and, and start thinking about things. Um, because even before I left, I had a bunch of ideas for our, our new year, our new decade here together on Patreon. Um, we're entering, well, not technically entering a new decade, but 2020 sounds sort of official, doesn't it? So I have lots of ideas. And last week I proposed a question. I just said, what, you know, give me some ideas of something that you would really like to see improve in your creative practice. And I received so many great responses and I've written them all down and I'm giving them all some thought. And some of them are fairly straightforward things that we can absolutely work on that are very technique based. And some of them are a little bit more abstract um, and that aren't really teachable things, but there are things that we can think about in different ways. And I'm, I'm giving it a lot of thought actually and, and how I can approach um, some of your your suggestions. They were all wonderful. I mean, just I I love to hear from you all um, what you're thinking about and, and what it is that you really want to learn because that's why we're here. We're here to learn. And this weekend, um, I met some remarkable people from around the world that are all um, probably the foremost Ruskin scholars in the world. I mean, they are. They, there, there, were, there were 12 of us all together, and I don't consider myself a Ruskin <laughs> expert in any way. But I think, I, I mean, the reason I was invited is because of my story. And I'm, in their eyes, sort of living proof of, of what can happen when you follow the principles some of the principles that Ruskin sets out for us as human beings, um, especially in, in the artistic realm. So I met so many people and I was deeply, deeply inspired and um, spurred to learn more. And and we have, as group as a group of people, we, we were with each other for three days. And so we had a lot of time to talk and have lunch and cocktails and breakfast and dinner and all of that. And and really get some wonderful ideas together um, for some future work that we all want to do together. But it also really encouraged me as a teacher and um, it sort of affirmed, it affirmed my own beliefs and my own way of teaching and my own path as a teacher. And so I want to share some things with you today um, that I've actually never shared here. And it's interesting because um, as a teacher um, here locally in my studio, I've had a lot of drawing students, not as many as I have online, but um, certainly I've had many. And um, pri either private students or in group settings. And I always, always begin with the same lesson. And it's the lesson that I began with. And I think um, out of all the lessons you could possibly ever begin, it's the very best one. And while Ruskin has informed, I mean, the real, the, really the foundation of how I approach my own work, I learned from him, you know, I learned from reading and following his book. Um, for over two years, it took me to get through this book. And I learned so much, but um, through that, I've gained sort of my own experience and my own way of expressing these principles, right? But there's one lesson that I always begin with, and it comes straight from this book, The Elements of Drawing. And if you don't know my story, um, I only began to draw and paint six years ago, almost six years. It'll be six years in April, in April or late March, I guess. And um, I have a story about it on YouTube if you want to look for, um, I want to say it's called Learning to See. But if you can't find it, um, it, it actually, I believe it's on this Patreon. It's like on the welcome page. It's the, it's the dandelion lesson video that, I, that I, I think I talk about my story there. So you can re watch that if you haven't. But I think most of you are familiar with it. 
And Ruskin's Elements of Drawing is the book that I use to teach myself. And this is a third copy I've, I've purchased, um, but initially I printed it at, at my printer and had it spiral bound, and that copy is so worn and dog-eared and falling apart. So I've had new copies since then. And I have one in my studio, and I have one here at home, and I, um, I've, I've read it, I mean, in parts of it, dozens and dozens of times. But there's one part that I believe um, that everyone should begin with, and we're going to talk about that today. And you'll notice that I have a lot of stones here um, <laughs> to talk to you about. And that's because after we talk today, my, my homework for you is to select a stone and your materials for our next video, which will be a drawing video. Because Ruskin believes, unlike, unlike some others, um, he believes that you should not begin with a brush as your foundation. He believes you should begin with a pointy, sharp, pointed object, either a pencil or a pointed nib pen, which we do both here. And I, that's how I began. And simultaneously, I was playing with the brush. I mean, I, you know, I definitely was doing painting simultaneously with this. But he believes that, you, you know, to begin with a sharp, pointed object like a pencil or a pen gets you off on the right start of having a delicate touch because he believes above everything else as far as technique goes having a delicate touch is the most important thing to make great art okay so um i i'm going to start by reading to you this passage and i highly recommend this book if you are very very serious about drawing um it will take quite a while to go through this book. It's, it's a couple years of work, um, of daily work. He, he recommends a minimum of a couple hours a day. And I put in a lot more than that. I mean, some days I drew for eight hours. So it is very serious and it's difficult sometimes. And, it, and I wanted to give up many, many times. And it's very different from how most people are taught drawing in schools. And um, I totally believe in it. But if you aren't the kind of person who wants to go through two years of hours and hours a day of study, then there is one lesson that I think says it all. And that's the lesson I'm going to read to today. If you did anything in this whole book, it would be this. Okay. So this is after many, many exercises already. And this is the lesson I want to read to you. Exercise eight. Go out into your garden or into the road and pick up the first round or oval stone you can find. Not very white nor very dark. And the smoother it is, the better. Only it must not shine. Draw your table near the window and put the stone, which I will suppose is about the size of A in figure five. So I'm not sure if these are actually the way they were in the original book, but so we'll talk about that in a bit. So draw your table near the window and put the stone on a piece of not very white paper on the table in front of you. Sit so that the light may come from your left, else the shadow of the pencil point interferes with your sight of your work. You must not let the sun fall on the stone, but only ordinary light. Therefore, choose a window which the sun does not come in at. So, obviously not an east or a west window and probably not a southern exposure window, but probably a northern exposure window. So, unfortunately, in my house, I don't have any rooms that have only northern light. I'm surrounded by windows in the studio, but I have a wall of windows that let in northern light. So... I have to just discern my shadows, right? And of course, I've got artificial light on right now. So when we draw, we're going to turn this off. <clears throat> okay. You must not let the sun fall on the stone, but only ordinary light. If you can, shut the shutters of other windows in the room. It will be all the better. But this is not of much consequence. He says, if you can only have that northern light, um, but otherwise, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. Now, if you can draw that stone, you can draw anything. 
I mean anything that is drawable. Many things, sea foam for instance, cannot be drawn at all. Only the idea of them more or less suggested. But if you can draw the stone rightly, everything within reach of art is also within yours. For all drawing depends primarily on your power of representing roundness. And I'll just insert here that that is the absolute truth. If you can once do that, all the rest is easy and straightforward. If you cannot do that, nothing else that you may be able to do will be of any use. For nature is all made up of roundnesses, not the roundness of perfect globes, but of variously curved surfaces. Boughs are rounded, leaves are rounded, stones are rounded, clouds are rounded, cheeks are rounded, curls are rounded. There is no more flatness in the natural world than there is vacancy. The world itself is round and so is all that is in it, more or less, except human work, which is often very flat indeed. So he goes on to talk about the stone and we're going to read more about that when we actually do the drawing. So let's talk a little bit about where he says if you can do if you cannot do that nothing else that you may be able to do will be of any use. He's kind of right. <laughs> um he's kind of right there. And here's the thing. I have taught this lesson to every single drawing student that I've had in, in my studio, in my presence, that, that wants to learn how to draw with a pencil or pen. And I have not had anyone not walk away with a very sensitively drawn stone with roundness, okay, that portrays roundness. Because we spent about two hours or more on that stone, all right? We look at it and study it and work at it until we achieve what we set out to achieve. So it demonstrates to someone what it takes to learn how to draw sensitively, okay? And to learn how to draw well. Someone who isn't willing to put in a couple of hours to draw a stone is probably never going to want to, to put in the time needed to draw in that way. Now, here's where I add in big, but not everyone wants to do that, right? Not everyone wants to do that. Not everyone wants to spend hours learning how to draw. Not everyone wants to pick up this seashell and make a beautiful, sensitive, delicate drawing of it or painting of it. Some people really just want to paint. They want to express themselves with color. And that is a beautiful thing. All right. So this lesson, what he's talking about is for someone who really, really wants to be able to set down and document the world around them and document their life in a sensitive, poetic, beautiful way with presence. And many of you have mentioned that in your questions. The things you're talking about that are not teachable, that, that are, I can't say here is how to do this exactly, those things come from time spent doing what I've just described, drawing a stone for two hours, all right? Those kinds of things come from learning how to see the world clearly, see the truth of what is in front of you, and taking the time to document something sensitively and delicately, all right? So... It's just, it, you know, it all comes back to the why, you know. This beautiful, beautiful Queen Anne's Lace is such a delicate, sensitive thing. This is not drawable exactly. There is no way that our eyes could possibly see everything we need to see to document it exactly how it is here, like a photograph, okay? That is not the purpose of this, all right? But by drawing a stone... We are learning how to sensitively document something with roundness so that we can draw things that are like this, that are not truly, truly drawable, right? Like, like he talks about sea foam, same thing. You couldn't possibly draw sea foam exact, but you can create the illusion of sea foam, okay? 
Our eyes become trained to work with our hands and our, our, our hearts, all right? We kind of bypass our brains because our brains can see every little detail on that Queen Anne's lace, right? They know that it's there. Our brains tell us that they're there, but our eyes can't possibly see it. And we only draw what our eyes can see, all right? It's just like when you see a landscape and and just like the snowy landscape we just did and you've got a tree line in the distance and our eyes from a distance cannot possibly see every leaf or every pine needle on those trees so we don't draw them and when we do it ends up looking a little false because our eyes can't possibly see that you know so so over time we learn what our eyes can see and what what our brain is telling us that our eyes see okay because our brain knows that pine trees have individual needles, all right? But I'm looking my, out my window right now, and the pine tree that I'm looking at, it's shapes of, of color. It's shapes of color of varying lightness and darkness, okay? All right, so if you want to do this lesson, and I hope that each of you will try it, because you might discover something about yourself that you didn't know existed, like I did. All right, you might discover that you really love sitting down with a rock and documenting it and learning how to see it, all right? If you want to do this, what I need you to do is go out and find a rock, okay? So let's talk about some of these rocks. He says not too light. This is too light, all right? He says not too dark. These are probably too dark, okay? He says smooth, all right, so not too rough and not too shiny. This is too shiny. This is too shiny. We don't want to see reflections like that, all right? <clears throat> he says smooth. This is smooth. It has roundness. It might not be exactly round, you know, like this one, which is also another really good example. I've drawn this rock. I can't even tell you how many times <laughs> I've drawn this rock. Many, many times. It's a beautiful rock to draw. All right? It's a really good one to see roundness. All right? You can draw it from all sides. It doesn't matter. Um, there's nothing wrong with this one. Okay? It's not, it's, it's smooth enough. All right? That would be a nice one too. This one is too rough for right now, and it's just too jagged. We're not going to see the roundness in this one. All right, so I'm trying to show you sort of how to how to pick your rock. This rock, by the way, um, is from Danangus, which is a very, very, very four or five thousand year old fort in Ireland. It's very special to me. And this is too busy. Okay, eventually you're going to draw stones like this, right? But too busy for now too confusing for now. So these two are really good. This one I would love to draw and I'm going to. This was a gift to me from Leslie. Um, she took me on the most amazing tour of the Huntington um, Library Gardens, Botanical Gardens, um, on Sunday. And I got to meet her. She came to my lecture and it was very, very special. And she gave me this rock. So I am going to draw it. But um, this would not be a good example for our first one, okay? If this was a little bit lighter, it would be great, but it's just too dark. So again, heart-shaped rocks, probably not great for this exercise. Um, this one would be okay. It might be a little bit busy, all right? And this one I think would be okay. It's, it's a little bit flat, but it would be interesting to draw. But I think for our first one, we want a sense of roundness not too light and not too dark. So it doesn't have to be totally round, but on the smoother side and, and sort of ordinary like this. Okay, so that's what you need to find. All right, you're gonna find that. You're gonna find a piece of drawing paper like Stonehenge or some other kind of drawing paper that has a vellum fine surface. You don't want it to be rough like watercolor paper and not too smooth and slick. So just sort of a medium texture and then you want to use an HB pencil and you want it to be very very sharp okay um, typically 
And in, in Ruskin's, um, in this lesson, he, he does talk about pen and ink too, but we're going to use pencil. All right, we're going to use pencil. And um, I don't teach exactly like him. <laughs> so when you find your pencil, this is a very, very long point. Um, but I sharpen my pencils with an X-Acto knife, so I get this really long, fine point. And then once it's sharp like this, then I can take it and I can refine my point on a piece of sandpaper. All right, you don't have to do this. All right, you don't have to do this. But when you do this, you get a really, really long, fine point that's just beautiful to work with. All right, so it's something to think about. Okay, something to think about. I know I, I talk about it on my Craftsy class too. This is how I sharpen my pencils. However, sharpening your pencil to a nice long point like this is really good. Just have your, your pencil sharpener nearby so you can keep it that way. You can also use um, sandpaper on, on pencils that are sharpened in a pencil sharpener. Do that all the time. Okay? So just make sure, however you choose to sharpen your pencil, that it's really, really sharp. And just an HB or an F. An F is fine, too. Um, you can go ahead and have a kneaded eraser if you want one, okay? Something that you can use um, if we want to, all right? And if you want, um, you could also have a paper stump or a, a tortillon. I don't know if we'll use it or not, but just have one just in case you might need to, all right? Because our, our whole goal is really to, to see our rock and represent roundness, all right? Whatever we need to do to get there. One thing I love about Ruskin is that he, he is not um, a snob about his materials and his processes. It's, it's really... It's whatever we need to do to get the result that we want, all right? There, there's, no, um, there's no dishonor in using an eraser. There's no dishonor in scraping your paper with a, at the knife if you need to lift out a highlight that you accidentally you know, went over. There's no dishonor in that. It's whatever we need to do to create the effect that our minds and hearts and hands want to create, okay? And so, don't, you know, just have the tools with you that, that you might need to use. Hold on, I need a drink of tea. I can't believe it, but I feel like I'm getting sick. My my throat hurts, it's scratchy. You know, it's like, <laughs> if, I'm in, if I encounter anything, I get it. It's crazy. So, all right, so those are your materials. And, and that's it. We're going to do it with, with pencil. Okay, so I want you to gather those things. I want you to think about um, the things we've talked about today. And I want to read you one other part here. Um, let's see. I want to read you the delicateness. Uh, here, this is wonderful. Yeah, no, that's too much. Okay. Hold on. Sorry. I don't... It's so uh, underlined and... Okay. This is... So I wrote here in the notes, this is everything. This is what I wanted to read you. Now, I believe that irrespective of differences in individual temper and character... The excellence of an artist as such depends wholly on refinement of perception. And that is this, mainly, which a master or a school can teach. So that while powers of invention distinguish man from man, powers of perception distinguish school from school. All great schools enforce delicacy of drawing and subtlety of sight. And the only rule which I have as yet found to be without exception respecting art is that all great art is delicate. 
Therefore, the chief aim and bent of the following system, so his system, is to obtain first a perfectly patient and, to the utmost of the pupil's power, a delicate method of work, such as may ensure his seeing truly. For I am nearly convinced that when once we see keenly enough, there is very little difficulty in drawing what we see. But even supposing that this difficulty be still great, I believe that the sight is a more important thing than the drawing. And I would rather teach drawing that my pupils may learn to love nature than teach the looking at nature that they may learn to draw. That's everything to me. That's my whole philosophy. Okay, that's, it really is. Even, even, I mean, it's just, and it's just grown stronger and stronger. And I have my own ideas about it too. But I believe this. I believe this. His only rule is that all great art is delicate. Even, even when you see big, bold paintings, he talks about this in, in Modern Painters, there is still a delicacy of technique and vision and thoughtfulness. It's not just slapped on fast. It's not just rushing through. I mean, we all do things like tiny landscapes and things, but the, the, you know, those are, are just to calm us down. For me, they're just to calm me down and to test colors and to do things like that. I'm not considering them um, finished, you know. It, it's just different, okay? But even those, because I have practiced and practiced to be delicate with my touch, to be delicate with color, even while I'm building up rich color, okay? I have, I have practiced and practiced a thoughtfulness about what I do. Even those tiny quick paintings become something much more beautiful than they used to be when I first started, okay? So, it's all about learning to see truly. And when it's like a light bulb moment, and I promise you this, it's like a light bulb moment when you put this work in and all of a sudden you understand what seeing really is, that it's not about knowing that this is a piece of Labradorite with all of these different colors shining and it's luminescent and all of those things. It's not about that. It's about looking at it and seeing it bit by bit. And, and the overall shape, sure, right? But not, not an outline, but the overall shape. But it's all about shapes and values of color. That's it. Okay? So we have to learn to override our brains. And by starting with this, we're going to begin to learn how. And so I think, I really believe that this kind of work is going to help you with some of those more esoteric questions and more abstract questions, the things that aren't readily teachable to us, all right, the things that we have to grow and put the time in and discover for ourselves, all right? So find your rock, find your materials, and we'll meet back in a day or so to do our lesson, all right? It's so good to be back. I will see you again very soon. Take care. Before we go, I have to share something with you. One of our dandelions, Clara, had the most generous giveaway on Instagram. And I never enter giveaways because I feel like I have enough and I'd rather it go to someone else. But her giveaway included one of her paintings. And Clara paints the most beautiful stones. So it came in the mail while I was gone. And I just want to share this with you since we're talking about stones. Isn't it so beautiful? It's framed and it's going right on my kitchen wall <laughs> where I sit every day and do my work. So I just had to share this. It's so, so beautiful. All right. Thank you, Clara, again. I'm just, I love it so much. It, it was, I was just shocked that I won. <laughs> so I just had to share it. And I'm going to find a way to pay it forward. Um, I have an idea for a giveaway too. I don't usually do those things, but... Um, I'll do it on Instagram, not here, because um, it's actually not allowed on Patreon. So, all right, everyone. Thank you, and I will see you very soon. Mm -hmm.